Today in the studio we have Pat Mazarol, and he's an attorney that I've known quite a while. And his background has been in estate planning, trust, and probate, charitable planning, uh, and nonprofits. And we're here today to talk about nonprofits. Welcome, Pat. Well, hi, Barry. Good to see you. You too. Um, we're just going to kind of tell me a little bit about your background. Well, I'm uh, an attorney, of course. I actually started out in the sciences. I'm a physics uh, background, worked in uh, technology for a few years and decided I really wanted to practice law. like that idea of, of engaging directly with individuals. And um, I spent most of my career actually in the, in the trust wealth management industry, which is around estate planning. We work with charities, private foundations, and so forth. And um, and I'm now practicing law with a, a firm in Minneapolis. Okay, and if I remember correctly, you were in the legislature as well. I was in the legislature for a term, uh, representing uh, West Bloomington, uh, South Edina, roughly. Uh, sat on the Judiciary Committee um, and uh, co Commerce Committee and Higher Education Committee and. Civil Law Committee. Well, that's, I think that's very interesting, actually. Um, well, we're going to, like I say, talk about nonprofits today because that's an area you're experienced in and have worked in um, for quite a while. And I think a lot of people are unaware of what a true nonprofit is, what the reasons for it is, what the benefits, um, why you would set one up, why you wouldn't set one up, how you set one up. So we're going to delve into some of those things today. I think I'll start out very general and ask you what a nonprofit organization is from a legal standpoint and a practical standpoint. Well, from a legal standpoint, it's uh, usually a corporation. It can be a different type of entity, but nearly all nonprofits in Minnesota are in a corporate form. Uh, so just like any for-profit type corporation, they're registered with the Secretary of State. They have a board of directors, they have a, a statement and articles of incorporation and bylaws and all of that. Uh, the real difference is with a nonprofit that it cannot be used for the benefit of uh, individuals. For instance, in a, in a for-profit corporation, shareholders make money from the corporation. That doesn't occur in a nonprofit. So who, who are they designed to benefit? Well, they're designed to benefit whoever the purpose or mission of the uh, nonprofit corporation says it's to benefit. So it may be children, may be uh, educational purposes, may be uh, um, uh, to address poverty, homelessness, that sort of thing. <clears throat> but it's really the beneficiaries are those that receive benefits from the corporation. And the beneficiaries can cannot be anybody who's part of the organization or uh, runs the organization? Well, it couldn't certainly couldn't be directly because you can't set up a corporation to benefit yourself and get the sorts of tax benefits uh, uh, and legal benefits that a nonprofit corporation is intended to give what we might call owners, though a nonprofit doesn't technically have owners. Um, those who want to set up a nonprofit really do so for uh, purposes of, of helping others. And so uh, that's, uh, that's really where the state says uh, and has guards against making sure you are profiting others by this organization, you're not profiting yourself. Now having said all that, those that run and, and work in nonprofit corporations certainly are entitled to salaries and compensation for the work they do. And is that probably like a reasonable salary for the work they do comparable to the same type of salary they get in a similar company? Exactly. Okay. And, and, and those are the kinds of questions that the IRS and the state will ask. Okay. So for example, um, the CEO of Red Cross makes a lot of money, I'm guessing, whereas they would have to be comparable to what he would make in the, he or she would make in the private sector. Is that true? That's accurate. Uh, it's true. Um, you know, the difference might be in a for-profit corporation that CEO would have stock, for instance, where the, as the corporation makes more money, uh, the employee makes more money with the stock or receives dividends or receives bonuses and so forth. With a nonprofit, 
strictly as you stated, uh, the uh, individuals, the leadership, and other employees are paid what paid for the work that they do, not for the increased value of the nonprofit itself. Okay. Um, aside from the intrinsic value of creating a nonprofit for beneficiaries, um, is it strictly a tax benefit that they're getting um, for that for doing those things? Is that the primary reason besides providing services or uh, finances to other individuals? It's definitely the primary reason. Uh, you know, with a nonprofit, you're able to receive donations from others, and those donations for, from the donors may be tax deductible. Um, there is exemption from, if properly done, exemption from state sales tax, exemption from federal income tax for any growth in the uh, income to the nonprofit. Uh, in some cases, exemption from property tax. Is there a type, can any type of company, as long as the, uh, the funds are used to benefit others, be set up that way? Or are there times where a company would be really edgy um, deciding if they were to do one? Yeah, I think the edginess would come, uh, or the test would come, really. And what what are what is their primary purpose, and and where do they really focus the majority of their activities? Uh, a nonprofit corporation is set up that way, primarily, not necessarily exclusively, but but really primarily to benefit others. Now, a nonprofit corporation may engage in other related activities that don't necessarily address that purpose directly and for that they'd end up paying taxes for that income. So, so nonprofits sometimes do actually pay tax? Correct. Okay and what type of thing do people um, um, are confused on a lot of times about the word nonprofit? Because I think do people think that if a company doesn't make a profit they're considered nonprofit sometimes, or do they wonder how do you get to a point where there isn't a profit? I mean, how does a nonprofit end up not having a profit? Well, there are certainly, as you know, many corporations that are intended for profit who go bankrupt and, and don't make a profit. Uh, a nonprofit really has to be directed at certain statutory purposes that are um, uh, in, intended to benefit the public. So, um, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not the typical type of merchandising sale for profit of, of merchandise and that sort of thing. It's, it's going out there and um, either directly benefiting others with work that the nonprofit does, like a public charity, or it may be a private foundation where uh, what, what the nonprofit private foundation does is gather funds and then direct them to other organizations that do that work. So it, it, it's re it really revolves around purpose. Um, their income and revenue, well, does that have to primarily come from donors or, or from, can they do other than like fundraising and donors, I mean, is there other where other areas they can receive income, or where would they re other places they would receive income? Yeah, there are other places. Uh, uh, some nonprofits are set up with uh, membership fees, for instance, or they may provide services where there's some sort of a fee for service that adds to their revenue, um, and um, and if that goes directly to the uh, nonprofit mission, um, it's not income per se, but, uh, but a lot of nonprofits, and I think what most of the public is familiar with, are the, the types of things that we give funds to, charities, and, um, and that's a big part of most nonprofit organizations. Let but, me give you a scenario, and you tell me if, if I were a client coming to you, what advice you would give them as far as if they could set one up or not. Mm -hmm. um, a small restaurant or coffee shop, and their purpose is to um, supply you know, food or beverages or coffee to people who are of low income um, and then maybe they have standards as to what's considered low income and they actually produce the products like anybody else would and they pay for it and then they basically, um, let's say sell them at very little profit or 
low, low cost, maybe just enough to cover their overhead. Um, but the primary purpose is to not have people come in and them to make a profit for money, but their purpose is to give to people with low income and come in who have low income. Is that something that somebody could do and still take a salary out? If they, they can take a salary and if it were set up so that anything over and above that is received as revenue beyond their expenses uh, goes into feeding itself back into serving those same people. So you can reinvest the money that you've had of income back in the business, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. What and you can't do is have, say, the owner, uh, I, I, I hesitate to call it owner because nonprofits don't have owners as such, but you can't have any individual receive any benefit from the, what we would call profit. The okay. revenue above expense. But if there, like you said, if there was a profit, uh, earlier you said if there's a profit over and above their expenses, they may have to be taxed on it. But you're saying that that's only directly related to something that's not for the benefit of what it was set up for. Correct. Is that right? That's called um, uh, unrelated business income tax. Almost like a side business or something like that. That's part of the organization. That's correct. Okay. All that's right. correct. Well, that's very interesting because. Um, why wouldn't somebody who has a restaurant like that and they have some kind of a mission but they still want to be able to make a living off it to a certain extent, I mean, um, what's, isn't that an incentive to do that type of thing? Well, I guess there's some immediate incentive. Uh, obviously, you know, most nonprofits, you would hope, are established from people who truly have that spirit around the mission of wanting to help others. Um, but let's say you've got someone that has a, a restaurant or a business as you've described and uh, from a short-term basis, yes, they're not making a profit. At the same time, they can't sell that restaurant and take personal income from it. For instance, you know, 10 years down the road, this is a going concern and it's generating more revenue than, uh, than expense and uh, they can't go out and sell it and take for themselves any sort of profit. They could sell it or transfer it, but there's no, but they'd have to basically transfer it as the way it is without a profit on the sale. Correct, the transfer essentially amounts to maybe a change in the board of directors. Okay, yeah, right. I mean, that, again, there's, keep in mind, there's no real ownership of the nonprofit. Okay, uh, you know. and, you can have other employees as long as they're reasonably paid based upon the work they do. Is that That's correct? correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, what does it take to, to start one legally? Yeah, to legally start, uh, establish the corporation doesn't take a lot, but it's, it's a filing uh, with the Secretary of State. And uh, there's certain things that need to be in the Articles of Incorporation to fulfill the, re the statutory requirements of, of being a nonprofit. Now that establishes an organization, but to really get all the benefits, all the tax benefits, there's a, a secondary follow-up step that's a, a little bit more uh, onerous, and that is applying to the IRS for that tax-exempt certification. And that's, um, uh, that takes a little bit more diligence and understanding what the questions on that form are all about. Do, does the IRS have to actually put their stamp of approval on it and say, yes, we allow it, or do they basically accept it and not really comment on whether it truly is a nonprofit? No, they very much question it. Uh, it's a, you know, they're looking for all the things that, uh, I mean, they're, they're um, purpose is to assure that all of the activities and purposes of the organization meet nonprofit statute and allow them to say, we're going to exempt you from tax. And with that, and so there's a number of questions behind that, you know, how do you operate yourself? How much are you paying your directors? How much are you paying employees? Um, are there any uh, side agreements? For instance, you couldn't have uh, someone uh, with, uh, let's take your example, with a, a food supply business who's supplying this restaurant and making money that way. Okay. So that's the what the IRS is just making sure there's no way this is being set up for individual profit. And how long does the IRS take once you submit it? 
on, uh, obviously they can vary in time depending on how the mm -hmm. IRS mm -hmm. works. They work at their own pace. Yeah. But, but on average, how long does it take to get something back from them? I tell clients figure on about six months okay. uh, to get back the certification. You know, when we had that uh, short government shutdown not long ago, that short shutdowns set things off about another three to six months afterwards. Right, so, I'm sure. <laughs> so there's circumstances. Right. But yeah, six months is about right. And so you said it has to be filed. To, well, you have to, the documents have to be produced. Correct. And I'm sure there's pitfalls if you do them incorrectly, which could jeopardize the nonprofit completely. Um, then you file it with the Secretary of State. Is that what you said? That For the original incorporation, correct. Okay. Is it a regular corporation or is it like a nonprofit organization you file with them? Uh, you file it, uh, it, it's pretty much like a regular corporation, but it's got all the terms within it that are uh, different. That, that are different okay. that make it nonprofit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what about the Attorney General's office? Do they get some type of filing with them at all or not? Yeah, the Attorney General's role. Um, Think of the non every nonprofit organization as really a, a public service, non-governmental public service, and so it doesn't have owners. As I mentioned earlier, there's there's so the real standing of protection of the organization is a protection of public service, and so the attorney general is sort of the attorney for the state and for individuals in the state. Uh, is uh, granted the authority over oversight of nonprofits, and that comes into play in a number of different ways. So they're aware of it, just like the Secretary of State and the IRS are. There's, there's a different disclosures, different filings for all those organizations. Correct. In okay. certain circumstances, there's a need to f actually file something with the Attorney General, but it isn't always oh, necessary. Okay. Yeah. okay. Just. But for instance, if a uh, if a nonprofit were sued. The attorney general gets notified. Uh, in Hennepin County, if a nonprofit is a beneficiary on an estate, and uh, that beneficiary designation is a is a formula, a percentage rather than a fixed amount, the attorney general gets notified because they're there to assure that the nonprofit gets what it's due, okay, and to assure that it's so. Protected. So it sounds like if somebody had an estate or a will or their own trust, mm -hmm. and they designate some portion, maybe all, but some portion of their estate to be donated to the nonprofit. Right. That is something that the um, Attorney General's office gets involved in. In Hennepin County, and if it's not a fixed amount. For instance, okay. if someone leaves $50,000 to a, a, a nonprofit, and they receive a check for fifty thousand dollars. There's nothing to be looked into. I see. If it's a formula, though, then, I see. Yeah. That's okay. What the okay. Gets I got gotcha. you. Um, like you said, to, to protect. Um, it sounds like to protect the the estate as well as the or the beneficiaries maybe of the estate as much as maybe the nonprofit. Well, it does help protect beneficiaries, but I think the purpose for the attorney general is to sort of in the terms I used earlier, to protect the public interest in this nonprofit. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, does a nonprofit have to file a tax return? Is it different than a corporate tax return? It's a different return. It's not a tax return per se. It's a Form 990. And effectively what it is is a um, uh, it, it, it can be pretty lengthy and more detailed even than our own uh, tax returns. But the purpose of that is to assure that the funds that are being received, the purposes for which they're being spent, uh, the salaries of the highest paid uh, employees and officers are all in line with what uh, is appropriate for a nonprofit. Okay. It, if I came in to you and said I want to start a nonprofit, mm -hmm. And how long does it take to get one where I can actually start operating my, my organization? Now, part of that, too, is the tax uh, notification to the IRS. Will that hold it up as well? Okay. Um, yeah, that's something that um, um, 
that takes a little understanding. Uh, you can actually start operating as soon as you get uh, verification from the Secretary of State that you are incorporated, that you're a recognized corporation. You know, the first thing is have your, like you would in a corporation, your board of first board of directors meetings and get up and running. The application to the IRS is really a certification of your tax-exempt status. And so, for instance, you might start receiving or wanting to receive donations to your nonprofit. Uh, if I want to give a $100 check to your nonprofit, I can do so, but I can't, take, uh, I, I can't be assured of my deduction if I want to take a charitable deduction until I know that you have that certification. And do I, does a nonprofit, nonprofit have an obligation to tell the donor this? Uh, I believe they do. Okay. I, I would tell my clients, make sure you tell every donor this. Transparency is always important up to the point that you exactly. don't want to have transparency for protection of your own self. Exactly. Okay. And, right. and the certification, by the way, is retroactive. It's just you can't be assured of it as a donor until okay. you see it. Okay. Um, is other than like ta well, other than tax returns, is any what what information is public? Well, everything that's filed with the Secretary of State. So your um, uh, your articles of incorporation are public. Uh, the fact you know who your directors are is public. Uh, at least initial directors. This Form 990 is a public record, so that can be searched. Oh, it is. And, uh, yeah. Even though it's a tax return. Even though it's, well, it's with the IRS, but yeah. It's, you can't you know, obtain it because it's a nonprofit. Because it's a nonprofit. Again, think in terms uh, of this public interest again. I get you. Know, it's really okay. like a public corporation almost. And, um, and frequently donors, particularly major donors, will want to will do that. They'll go and search that 990. See to make sure they're not getting scammed, probably, Excuse right? me. <laughs> yeah, <you're> correct. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and they want to see, you know, that, for instance, the percentage of funds that are going directly to benefit others is high enough and that there isn't a high percentage on salaries or right. administration. I'm sure there's some fudging on that for a smaller... Um, nonprofits where they take a higher salary maybe than they should be, mm -hmm. um, but there's no direct oversight, I'm guessing, on that, um, other than maybe an audit or correct. that type of thing. That's correct. Not advisable, but people do it, I'm sure. It, it can happen. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, not, not, my, no, no, well, not with my clients. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Well, at least you tell them not to, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Um, What about st the actual, again, we're going to go back to starting a nonprofit. Is that something that somebody could do themselves? Uh, yes. <laughs> as, uh, as a lawyer, I guess, yes, you could. Um, uh, the problems, of course, run into. There are issues of um, doing it accurately. Uh, and not having a back and forth conversation either with the Secretary of State or with the IRS uh, before you before you get it right. Um, and the IRS, you asked earlier about the IRS's diligence on this application, and it, and it's pretty intense. So even prepared by a lawyer, there might be some follow up back and forth conversation. So. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I suppose someone could search for the forms and at least get a form uh, uh, a nonprofit established, but I think it's sort of it's the compliance that comes after that okay. in particular that becomes troublesome. Do you do um, follow-ups? In other words, or I should say, do, do you recommend follow-ups to make sure everything's in compliance, like yearly or pretty much unless they come to you and say have questions? Or is, do you think it's a good idea that people check with you every so often to make sure things are going right? I strongly, strongly recommend it. I mean, there, there are, you know, there are annual filings with the Secretary of State that are, are pretty straightforward. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that, for instance, your corporate minutes are up to date, uh, that you're exercising a proper duty of due diligence over how funds are being spent. And, um, 
And I think having that recorded and having an attorney on retainer of some sort to do that is advisable. All of my nonprofit clients do that. Okay. That's something that I talk to them about. I think one of the dangers a person can, who wants to start a nonprofit can have is they're immersed in the mission, doing good and wonderful things for others. Um, and uh, a lawyer can be troublesome. Yeah. <laughs> but, but in fact, it's the lawyer's uh, oversight that will help keep them in compliance and out of trouble. I always equate it to like an insurance policy. Correct. Um, you buy insurance and you pay what it is and hopefully you never use it. But if you need it, it's there. And going to an attorney and having them do everything for you and look it over and um, advise you on things is, again, insurance. And if they don't find anything wrong, it's still good insurance to pay because they, you know you're doing everything right. You know you're doing it right, yes. By the way, uh, Barry, that can also have implications uh, not only on the tax side but also on personal liability side. There are statutes that protect directors of nonprofit organizations if they're if they're not compensated directors. In other words, if they act uh, without compensation, they're protected from a good deal of liability. But in order for that to apply, they need to be within the scope of their duty. Mm -hmm. They need to be exercising good faith. And uh, to your prior question, having an attorney around to oversee that and making sure you're always within that box is, is going to be strong protection for that. What are some of the top things that can throw somebody out of compliance with a nonprofit and all of a sudden they're not a nonprofit anymore? Yeah. Well, a big one is not filing uh, their 990 or other annually required forms. Uh, another one, which we've talked about in a couple of contexts here, is, um, is overpayment of uh, directors, someone getting a benefit that's clearly beyond what they should. Um, and, and not performing the duties that, uh, that they're established to do. You know, the Attorney General does set out certain duties that all directors have. Uh, there's a duty of due care uh, for the organization, which means they have to be active participants and knowing participants in the board, um, keeping minutes and books and that sort of thing that a, a lawyer can help them with as part of that. There's a duty of loyalty to the nonprofit, so you know, things like uh, self-dealing are prohibited uh, with any, say, outside corporate uh, organization the nonprofit might work with that maybe a director owns. Uh, there's a duty of obedience to all the laws. That's sort of the compliance we've been talking about to the governing documents. Um, and so, you know, that's, um, it's a relatively heavy burden. So you pick directors carefully um, but you also um, want to make sure that it's directors who are focused on the mission. With, with all these uh, uh, obligations and risks that a director takes on, why would somebody want to be a director? Because they're good people. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they behave. As long as they behave. I, I mean, you know, I think uh, the state looks favorably on on nonprofits, it is a public service, and and uh, the intention isn't to uh, to have a gotcha on on directors who give of their time and resources. Uh, but at the same time, you have to make sure you're you're doing it for the right purposes and not getting personal benefit from it. And in that corporate document you spoke of, where it has the mission, so to speak, about the nonprofit, is that that's correct? That's right? correct. Mm -hmm. um, how specific or vague can you be in there and can be across the board on different things that you're deciding to uh, have a mission on? There's actually some, some standard language that can be used that's, that's very broad. Um, I encourage my clients, though, if they're doing this, to think through what's their real purpose. And, and I attempt to have them somewhat narrow it, leave, leave enough breadth in there so that you know they aren't going to get caught going outside of what their purpose is, uh, but narrow it in the sense of it focuses the board and it focuses them on why are they really doing this, and I think it, uh, um, uh, it, 
helps focus the organization toward its purpose. The answer to your question, though, is it can be either broad or narrow. Okay. But but all of it is related to helping the public in some way. And, and if you have it narrow and you go outside that scope a little bit, is there a problem with that? There really isn't. I okay. mean, you, you know, even, even when I have clients narrow it, I'll include some broader language, too. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But the idea is by, by coming up with some narrower language, it, it tells the state and the IRS and themselves, this is what we're really trying to do. And if you go beyond it, you're still covered. So it sounds if, like if you have some, ch if you have charitable intent, um, so to speak, to the public good and the pub, you know, to, to give beneficiaries the benefit of what you c can raise money on and spend money on them on, and really have some good intentions, um, understand that you can still make some money off of what you're doing for your time. Sounds like it's a pretty good thing to do if you're in that sort of sphere. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, we both know people who are executive directors of, uh, of, of fine nonprofits, make a, a reasonable living off of that, uh, but and it, in substance, their heart is really into the mission of that nonprofit. Do, uh, do a lot of directors not even take any money? Or do they have to, or do they take some? Or I mean, how is it commensurate with what they, yeah, the work they do? Yeah, generally, well, rarely do you see um, a director of of the board taking uh, any compensation. Perhaps expenses, reimbursement of expenses, but uh, usually board members are not compensated. And as I mentioned earlier, in order to take advantage of the statute protecting them from liability, they need to be uncompensated directors. Okay. So, so they don't get a salary. On the other hand, executive directors, though, who those who function really with the day-to-day -day operation of the nonprofit. Uh, typically, uh, they don't have to be, but typically are compensated, and I think should be. You know, that's that's a legitimate expense to have an, an, an executive director on staff. And, and the executive director is really the, the person running it. That's correct. They're like the head honcho who's yeah. running it the day to day, as if they were running a company. That's themselves. correct. Okay. That's the president right. of the corporation. And you have to have a board of directors. You have to have a board of directors. You have to have at least three on that board. Um, typically when you get started uh, you'll, you'll name three or more uh, as your original board and in most nonprofits that board of directors is um, self-perpetuating, self self-sustaining in that they elect the next board, they assure that the board continues. Nonprofits typically and by statutory default don't have members. They have a board of directors, which again is not an owner, but basically the runs the ones that make all the decisions. And in a nonprofit, what do the actual directors do? Do they, and how often do they meet? Yeah, they meet. Um, uh, I have them meet at least annually, um, depending upon the activities of the organization. Um, they might meet more frequently than that. But their primary role is to oversee the executive director of the organization to assure that um, uh, that the finances are appropriate, they're being appropriately handled. They approve the 990 before that goes out to the IRS. Um, and, um, and they assure that all the operations are within the, the four corners of the uh, Articles of Incorporation and Bylaws. And are there legal documents that are involved in those annual meetings where people, the directors sign off on or make the executive director um, sign off on? Or is it, is it basically, basically due diligence and um, without any kind of a documentation of it? Yeah, pri well, the, the meeting is documented through minutes, and that's another one of those things that an attorney can help make sure are kept um, are, are kept up to speed, up to date. And the minutes are there to say what did the board of directors do, and depending upon the bylaws and the organization, oftentimes in that annual meeting, they'll be renewing. Um, uh, the role of the executive director, they'll be approving an annual budget, they'll be 
as I said earlier, approving the 990, kind of all of the, the high level oversight. They'll assure that, you know, they'll get reports on the activities of the organization during the year and are those activities within the mission uh, the, uh, and purpose of the organization. Okay. Um, well, being an attorney myself, who haven't worked directly in nonprofits, I learned a lot. Um, and I really appreciate you coming in today and telling me and telling everybody about them and explaining what they're about and what they are and what they're not and the whole operation. So I really much appreciate it, Pat. And um, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Well, I thank you for the time, Barry. I thank you for a good set of questions that should help some of your listeners. And I will say, you know, it's uh, doing nonprofit work is, is, is a noble call, and, uh, but uh, keep in mind it needs to be done right. Uh, good intentions don't get you past uh, some of the legal pitfalls. I agree. So, Pat, if the listeners have uh, any questions and want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Well, they can uh, call me. Um, my uh, telephone, my office phone is 952-921-5853. Uh, they can uh, look at our website, uh, which is C. Erickson, E-R-I-C-K-S-O-N, law, L-A-W, so C. Erickson, law, dot com. Um, or they can uh, email me directly at P. Maserol, P. M. A. Z. O. R. O. L. at C. Erickson Law dot com. Sounds great. Again, I appreciate you coming in, and um, we'll talk again. Thank you, Barry. Thank you.